Hello. It's Friday, the 22nd of May. It's 7pm and it's I'm Magician Live. Welcome everybody to iMagician Live. I'm Jamie Allen and I am joined by my fantastic co-host for a start, Mr. Tommy Bond. Hello, Tommy. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's getting hotter and hotter, isn't it? It certainly is. I've spent a little bit of time in the garden this week. Yeah, good. No, it's good to hear. We all need to relax a little bit. And uh, I'm sure we're relaxing a lot. And uh, we've also got the magnificent Mr. Adam Heppenstall. Hello, Adam. Hello, guys. How are you doing? All right. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. What have you been up to this week? Uh, I haven't touched any tools this week. Yes! Um, <laughs> finally! <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. It's happened. <laughs> yeah. He's put it's his happened. tools down at last. I've put my tools, step away from the tools. Uh, <laughs> so what have you been doing then? Uh, well, I've been uh, doing bits of magic. I've been editing show reels, doing a bit of video work this week, so it's been good fun. Uh, mm. Important to stay on top of our game. It know, really is. Ed- any minute now, the entertainment industry will just open back up. The turn of the key, <laughs> and we're all right back there. But in the meantime, we're stuck in our offices. And uh, also, we have uh, Natalia Love. Nat is here. Hi, Nat. Hello, world. And we have got a great show planned this week. So, what do we have coming up on the show, Bond? Oh, we've got the news of the week, and we've also got a great bad trick of the week. Should be good. Oh, good. A good bad trick of the week, eh? That's what we shall look forward to that. It's an oxymoron. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And uh, speaking of oxymorons, Adam, what do we have coming up? <laughs> yes, yeah, smooth. <laughs> nice link. <laughs> well, fresh from illusionist, we've got the incredible magician, the incredible illusionist, James Moore. One worth watching. Ah, yes, the deceptionist from The Illusionist, James Moore, will be joining us. Natalia, Nat, what do we have coming up on the show? We have Matt Donnelly, the mind noodler, who is also the head writer of Pen and Teller Fool Us. And also coming up later on the show, we've got the CEO of one of the largest manufacturers of magic sets for the general public, a man that has put magic into so many people's hands and inspired generations of magicians. The legendary Marvin Berglass will be here, the CEO of Marvin's Magic. And that's all coming up on I Magician Live. Coming up next on our show, we've got a friend of mine who is a bit of a global phenomenon, really. Uh, His name is James Moore. Now, he was on uh, Britain's Got Talent years ago and amassed over 100 million hits. And in fact, he's from your neck of the woods, Tommy. Are you there? Absolutely, he's from my neck of the woods. And I'm so proud. And it's great to have him on the show tonight. It's it's going to be brilliant. It is. He's a good Bournemouth boy. And now, um, I have to tell you that although this show is live wherever we can be, unfortunately, James is working right now can you believe this man has a gig it sounds like he's very fortunate to me not unfortunate yeah he has a he has a gig so uh we caught up earlier on today with james on zoom and uh we're gonna play in that interview now so tommy if you have it let's hit it and let's bring on the incredible mr james moore here he is james moore is fast becoming one of the most successful illusionists on the planet
James, how you doing? Hey Jamie, good, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, that's a hell of a setup you've got there. Where are you? Welcome to Portugal. I'm actually at uh, Studio 33 in Portugal. For those watching that don't know where that is, um, it's in the heart of Portugal and it's a, a magic studio, a massive facility uh, designed and built not single-handedly by uh, magic superstar Luis de Matos. Absolutely. I'm a massive fan of Lewis's, you know, absolutely incredible. And it's great to see what he's doing. Such a such an entrepreneur and, you know, so forward thinking with everything that's going on right now in the crisis and inspiration to everybody. But um, so what are you doing keeping busy yourself over there? Are you, I see you're uploading a lot of magic. You must be working on what's next. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a great opportunity for me to kind of take a moment to take a step back and uh, make my next move, you know, make plans for my next move um, and well, just learn create and develop. Uh, where are you supposed to be right now? You know, if the shows, if the illusionist was still going, would you be on tour right now? Yeah, well, actually, I'm currently supposed to be uh, doing a show called Now You See Me uh, in Singapore. Um, oh, yeah, we're going to play the trailer for that in a moment, because that's pretty epic, that show. You must tell us about that show, because that started, what, two years ago? Two years ago, uh, now you see me, um, well, obviously I'm sure a few people know of the movie, um, but Lionsgate wanted to develop uh, uh, a live entertainment show based around the movie. So they joined f forces with the producers of The Illusionists um, and they collaborated to make, it's not really following the story uh, of the movie, but it's, it's the show that the horsemen would be doing in the movie. And disappointingly, if you do get the chance to come and see it, um, we won't be putting any money in anyone's bank accounts. And, you don't get that joke, and I'm sure you've got plenty of time to watch the movie right now. Yeah, totally. The visuals for that show were just off the charts, and I was looking at the set design and everything. It's just epic to see magic on that scale, which is in no small part down to the illusionists. Their tremendous success, which you've been a, a big part of, and of course, Louis Tomatos. But uh, how long have you been in the illusionists? Because you're kind of a big figurehead for them, really. Sure. I mean, I started with the illusionists directly after, I think, Britain's Got Talent, which was back in 2013. And I started on The Illusionist 2.0, which was the kind of follow-up to the original show that they had. Um, and then I've been working ever since for the last six and a half years with them. Wow, it's, uh, it's just an epic ride. And you must have been on so many tours of that thing. I mean, every time I see you on Facebook, you're in a different country, different part of the world, you know, and just the sheer number of people that you must have played to. It's sure. unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and the thing with that show is, is, depending on which tour you're on, the dynamic completely changes. I remember in America, there were so many one-nighters and we were on a sleeper bus, so we were all exhausted. I mean, we, we had a chance to stop at the hotel in the morning, take a shower, and then we were immediately into the theatre, uh, you know, loading in. Um, so it was very much intense, whereas Europe is a little bit less strenuous. Um, we get a bit more time to ourselves. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed being in Europe recently. For people, we've got a lot of English viewers on this show, and a lot of them will have seen the production of The Illusionists in the West End recently. And although you bring some pretty big, 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 excuse me, some pretty big gear onto the stage, you know, you were telling me that the shows in Europe are, are a much bigger scale than what we saw in London, which was a lot more comedy and things. Do you carry an awful lot more gear when you're with the show in Europe? Well, the problem with London was that we were in such a small theatre and there was no space backstage. So we were limited in terms of what we could do at the Shaftesbury. A lot of English theatres are very, you know, small uh, in terms of size backstage. So, yeah, Europe, we, we had trucks full, trucks full. So we could just take, take whatever. And Yeah, well, it's interesting because... Somebody told me about The Illusionist that they also felt with the British audience that they would engage more with the chat and the comedy. But I disagree with that because uh, you were a massive hit in that show. I mean, I was sat in the audience on two occasions watching it and you could just feel the energy when that stuff's coming on and off the stage. It was, uh, it was really something. So I, I wish I could see it uh, in Europe. When do you think the show will return? Have you any bets when you think it might come back? Or? I mean, I imagine probably kind of yeah, probably midway or at the end of next year before this you yeah. know, crisis is over. Um, but I'm sure yeah. it will be done, yeah. Yeah, no, it'll come back and you'll come back stronger and bigger. I was going to ask you like what your ambitions are, James, because you've been associated with these mega brands for so long, also whilst creating your own brand and your own fan base, over 100 million hits on YouTube. You know, you're no, uh, you're no stranger to celebrity. So what is your next move? What's your ambition and your dream, James? I mean, I think over the next few years, I just want to develop material. I've, you know, I, I've always wanted to just 
do the best I could at what I do. Um, and I've, I'm always learning. I've never kind of felt like a celebrity or I've never felt at the top of my game. I've always kind of just kept learning, um, you know, from inspirational people such as Luis. Um, and there is so much more to learn. So I don't want to put out my own show until I'd feel comfortable um, with it being something that I'd be happy to see. So yeah. I, I think I'll spend the next few years touring uh, with you know, shows like The Illusionist, gaining, that, gaining more experience, developing new material and good material. And then I think in a few years, I'll probably put all that material into my own show. Yeah, I, I think you'll be a big hit because you have the one quality that can't be taught, you know, that you are the show. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's something small or whether it's grand. You have a great style and a look about you and your presence and everything. It's something that can't be taught. It's a star quality and you, you certainly have it, mate. So, That's very uh, kind. Thanks, Jamie. Oh, no, it's absolute pleasure. I know you're going to come through this thing in flying colours. And um, right now, we're going to take a look at some of your incredible work. And we're going to come back and say goodbye in a moment, James. But right now, let's take a look at the incredible Mr. James Moore. There's a very good reason why uh, casinos make us use these as opposed to real money. And that's because we have far less of an emotional attachment to them. And therefore, we're not as bothered when they disappear. been up to at the moment so like i say i'm i'm in this facility in portugal and this is an amazing place uh, it's got a library you've got you've got an in-house theater here they're running live entertainment events outside uh Luis has just launched uh, a new drive-in show which is a, a great solution to the current you know entertainment live entertainment problem with the really health crisis. Um, and i've taken the opportunity to start learning and developing other skills in magic um, and one of the things that i've picked up along the way uh, is this, the EMC. Um, I know that some of you may feel that the dates um, are, are a bit, you know, past the time, but they're not. This is kind of the new tar bell of magic, I would say. Um, they're incredible. I think each set has eight discs and there are lectures and, and um, yeah, yeah, talks from some of the greatest minds in magic. David Copperfield, David Blaine, one of my personal favorites, Richard Wiseman. Um, they, they are incredible, incredible dish sets and I would advise anyone that's got some time on their hands at the moment, which I'm sure plenty of you have, to get these um, and start learning. 
if I could dive off into my shelves here, I've got two of them right here. And they're incredible. Um, the, there's a thing on there where Lewis talks about, we have get a lot of uh, normal people watching this show as well. So I won't talk about any methods. I certainly wouldn't do that anyway. But uh, there's a thing on there where Lewis describes his Angry Birds routine. And that just goes to show how incredible that guy is because the how in depth <laughs> the yeah, method the is. So many layers. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And I love watching it because it, it actually makes you laugh, you know, as a magician, just with the sheer joy of how complex it is, but how simplistic and beautiful the effect is. So yeah, I do recommend I do recommend those discs. I receive no financial gain <laughs> for saying that. But uh, neither do I. Neither yeah, do I. No. No, we're just big fans of the man himself. But uh, James, I want to thank you for taking your time today to come on the show. I know that you genuinely are busy. You genuinely are working all hours over there. So uh, thanks for taking Lewis, some time. Lewis to doesn't let anyone us. stop. He never stops. So no. it's a great place to be and, and good for the mind. It's very good for the mind. Well, give my best to Lewis and Vanessa and uh, James. I want to thank you again for coming on the show. I really do appreciate You're it. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Okay, no Take problem. Care. See you later, James. Bye bye. Want to have a peek at bad trick of the week? Bad trick of the week. Bad trick of the week. If it's bad magic that you seek, watch bad trick of the week. We have been having so many comments every week about this next section. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the bad trick of the week. Over to you, Adam. Now, Tommy, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit uh, worried about this week, really, because, I mean, OK, we're in lockdown. I've been searching through all the drawers, finding all the rubbish tricks that I've got laying around, and I've run out of rubbish, uh, rubbish tricks. I really haven't got anything. I, I mean, I don't know what to do um, other than, you know, like the, the thumb trick or I could do the bendy pencil trick, you know, where you make the pen. Oh, wow. But, well, that's, that's just, a, no, it's a, just a rubber pencil. No, no, no. It's a real pencil. It's just a wooden pencil. You just kind of shake it like this and it makes it look what? all wobbly. It, it. It's not... It's not a real pencil because it's, it, it's 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 wobbling. No, no, Tom, it's a real pencil. It's wooden. It's if you just kind of wobble it at the end like this, it just makes it look like it's a, a rubber pencil. It's just a little visual illusion. No, no, it's you've switched it. No, Tommy, I didn't switch the that's, pencil. That's not... No, 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 it's wooden. You hold it at the end. And if yeah. you just bounce it. Look, it's wooden, solid, and, and it's just hold... it's just a it's just a rubber pencil. Tommy, this is a real pencil. This is I haven't got any bad tricks. It's not. A, it's not. It's 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 a it's. It's, it's, but that looks so cool, Tommy. You're joking. This is a this is a real pencil. You well, are... can't be because it's, it's it's going up and down. As you Tom, do this, it's, it's, it's Tommy, going up and down. Look, this is a real. You just shake it and it makes it wobble. Okay, it's not real, Tommy. It's a real pencil which you just make look rubber. It's not a rubber pencil. I'm not switching anything out. But you can't do that. If a rubber pencil, Tommy, really this is a wooden and... pencil. But it's going up and down. It's a rubber oh, pencil. Oh, for God's sake. Listen, if doing. we weren't social distancing, I would shove this pencil right up your... And thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tom. My Magician Live is all about trying to bring new experiences, and I think I'm about to do that. This man... Some people in England won't have heard of him. A lot of you magicians will have done. Um, this man is very, very well known uh, in Las Vegas, and he has such a diverse portfolio. You know, he's like king of podcasts, in my opinion, because he seems to be on every <laughs> single podcast that I ever tune into. Um, he is uh, a magician in his own right, but more importantly, he has a tremendous magical mind, and he has a great way at looking at presentation. I promise you, you're going to get some great insight from this, and you're going to want to know a lot more about my my guest, here he is, Mr. Matt Donnelly. Hi, Matt. Hi, thank you. That was such a tall order of an introduction. I thought you were talking about somebody else. I was excited. <laughs> I was excited to hear this interview. Yeah, no, seriously. I, I was. You first came to my attention through the Sunday School podcast, which we're going to talk about um, later yeah, on. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that I believe we met first time on Foolers. Um, yes, when we you did. Were yeah, and I didn't put it together at the time that you were the most, same person. Most don't. Most don't. Uh, when you come on as a contestant and fool us, first off, you're constantly escorted around in secret around the Penn and Teller Theater because Penn and Teller can't see you or know that you're on the show until you set foot on the stage. And then so I'm just one of the army of people that kind of jostle you around and find you and ask you a bunch of questions. So I know that I was like one of six people to talk to you about your background before you went on, on stage. So most people don't remember me as an individual guy. I'm just part of this foolish army when you're there on the show. 
Uh, just if you're joining us at the moment, I said this at the top of the show, but Matt is the head writer on the show Foolers, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Uh, but before yeah. Matt was a magician, <laughs> and before he was uh, surrounded by this world, um, he was a uh, you know a big a big name comedian. Really, it's fair to say you did a lot. You won a lot of awards. Uh, you were on a lot of shows on the strip, and you uh, involved in the writing of a lot of those shows. I think, and I just wondered if you could kind of give us a. Uh, a little overview of what that was and how you came into this world. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, in New York City, uh, I came up in the uh, improv comedy scene and, um, you know, Upright Citizens Brigade, People's Improv Theater, Magnet Theater. Uh, you know, Amy Poehler was a teacher of mine before she got on SNL. I remember uh, there was a time as a student where she had booked a Tide commercial and we all went out to the bar to celebrate as a class. Um, and uh, from there, I just kind of stayed involved in comedy and, um, you know, myself and a lot of friends just found different ways to stay in. And uh, improv gives you a background where both you love to play yourself, you also have to play other people, which lends itself to writing. So I started writing um, sketch comedy and then writing for other voices when I got the chance. Um, I moved out to Las Vegas and I ended up um, meeting uh, Penn Gillette's wife, Emily Gillette. Uh, and I kind of got into Penn's circle that way right when they started doing a show on Discovery Channel. Um, and with my comedy background, there wasn't a lot of television shows being made in Las Vegas, so I, I just begged to intern on the show. Right. They let me intern uh, with them, and then Penn knew of my comedy background, so he let me write some jokes uh, for the script. Let me take a pass, and they kept um, enough of my jokes that they decided to hire me as a comedy writer from that point going forward. All right, so it's fantastic. And is it true, or is this just an internet rumor, that you became a magician because Penn dared you to? <laughs> no, that's very true. That's <laughs> very true. I was running my mouth off, you know. Um, you know, as an artist, we always live paycheck to paycheck, but it just seemed like I was I was on, like, season four or whatever. I was doing my fourth season of Fool Us, and I, was just I just talked to magician after magician, and they all are making a living in some capacity or another, and it just hit, it just dawned on me that, magicians have different paths to make some kind of income uh there's there's more diff there's more paths to do that than there is in comedy comedy you can either hit big as a stand-up or you can hit as a writer you know but there aren't a lot of like lower tier you don't do a lot of stand-up at birthday parties you don't do strolling stand-up at, at at really high-end parties and fundraisers you know um it's just really difficult and so I, mouthing off to Penn, i was like you know what i should just learn for magic tricks and do what these corporate guys do, you know? And uh, <laughs> Penn kind of heard me mouthing off and he goes, oh, you should, you should learn magic. Why don't you just learn a trick and see how hard it is? And I was like kind of sweating because at that point I was, was co-host of his podcast. So I was used to kind of being challenged by him in the past for other things. And, uh, and he said, uh, it'll be harder than you think, but you might be better at it than you think. Listening to you on the podcasts, uh, the thoughts that you have about magic, your thoughts about its theory and its presentation, is far more in-depth than most magicians than I know. I mean, I, I went to a performing arts high school, you know, uh, a special school where you could specialize in acting at an early age, and went to college, you know, to study in university with, with acting as well. Uh, always with kind of using comedy as my superpower. I started performing comedy every Friday and Saturday night when I was like 15, 16 years old, um, doing improv shows and stuff at, at theaters, not like as part of school programs, but, but out and about at, at theaters and stuff. Um, and so I spent about 20 years really kind of in that world, um, performing in every kind of environment possible. So yeah, I think I had a huge advantage. I had a huge advantage of picturing the performance environment with the challenges of magic. And so I was like, oh, you know, Penn told me to learn a, a trick. Uh, rather than go to Penn first, I, I work with Johnny Thompson on Fool Us. And that's another thing. In terms of my background in magic, I was very lucky. I was in the room. I'm in the room for every rehearsal with Johnny Thompson, uh, Mike Close, um, Andrew Golder, Lincoln Hyatt, like the producers of the show who have produced television talent and the magic wing of, of, of Johnny Thompson and Mike Close. It's really incredible, isn't it, to come into magic and you've got best friends like Johnny Thompson, Penn and Teller, Piff the Magic Dragon. You know, that's a what a phenomenal knowledge these people have. 
It's stupid. No, it really is. I mean, it's just dumb. I, I'm so lucky. And I know it because I struggled to break through in comedy, trying to break through as an actor, trying to break through as a stand-up, trying to break through as a writer. I mean, I book stuff. You know, I got little stuff, a lot of little stuff here and there. I, I, I have an okay resume, an okay IMDb page or whatever it was. But I know the difference, right? So I know when you're gigging versus when you start to actually hit with something. And uh, to have their input from the very beginning is is silly. So, like... If, if no one should ever ask me, should, should my career keep it going? You're like, how, how do you get into magic? It's like, you, you can't do what I did. I can give you no advice. I was just surrounded by an embarrassing amount of first-class help to get me started. Yeah, it was incredible. In fact, in a moment, we're going to play in the clip of you appearing on <laughs> Foolers. <laughs> because there's a moment when Penn and Teller see you coming onto the show and they look like they're just being wound up. <laughs> Tommy, let's play that clip. Hey, I'm Matt Donnelly, and I have no business being a professional magician. I uh, started as an improviser, improv comedy. I moved to Las Vegas, and as luck would have it, became friends with Penn. So I co-host Penn's podcast, and I've been doing that for about six years. I got into magic on a dare. I kind of was mouthing off and saying, like, I should just learn a trick. And Penn said, you're right, you should. I think it's hilarious to go on Fool Us and mess with my friends. Right. What's your name? Morgan. Morgan, I knew that. I read your mind. No problem. And right over there, I can read Penn's mind. He's thinking... What the hell's Matt doing up there? <laughs> I can read Teller's mind. He's thinking... <laughs> Actually, Morgan, Teller's thinking he hates that joke. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what's it like performing for your friends Penn and Teller? You know, I started Magic basically on a dare by Penn. And so put a preview together of my first Magic show. And so I can tell you... Don't do your first magic show ever in front of Penn and Teller. <laughs> Teller taught me a rope trick with a knife. I cut my finger open. I bled all over myself, and it did not go well at all. I'm very happy to, be, to get back here and at least do something pretty, pretty good in front of them. All right, let's see if your friends Penn and Teller figured it out. All right. All right, Penn, Teller, this guy. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Matt Donnelly is my co-host on Penn Sunday School. We do a podcast together every single week. And yet, he has been keeping this from me for months that he's showing up on this show. Oh, I'm learning magic. I'm working on a few new things, Penn. I hope you get to see him someday. Won't that be fun? What tricks you working on, Matt? Oh, you know, just stuff. <laughs> so you come here after co-hosting my show for, what, seven years? And you've got a trick you're trying to sneak by me? I'll tell you, Matt, it's amazing. <laughs> it's pretty amazing because we've done a beautiful performance that absolutely killed. I've got to tell you, it's astonishing in every single way, but you thinking you can fool us, you rat bastard? <laughs> I'll tell you, it's a great trick, but it didn't add up. And if you think you fooled us, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> no, it does not add up. You did not fool us. Isn't that right, Matt? Uh, it's true. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Busted. But it was my lifelong dream to perform for you guys. That's not true either. I... It, was, it was so funny. Did you ever think you were going to fool them? Because I, I think you had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. So um, when, <laughs> when Teller and Penn started walking back to their chairs after I performed, Teller said, okay, so before he got out the calculator, you know, he started going over the facts and Penn just said, shut up, Teller, shut up, Teller, shut up. We have everything. We know everything. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so, so I was the only interview that they've ever watched. They just watched me get interviewed by Allison because they're normally talking. Uh, they just so watched funny. my interview. It was a remarkable piece of TV, you know. I mean, when I did that show, I went in with my eyes open because I thought I'm doing a trick that will no, no way it will fool them. In a million yeah. years, this trick won't fool them. Um, and I knew that from the outset. Maybe right. there's a half percent chance yeah. that if they accepted that the technology they didn't understand exactly and they accepted that as a method. But that's just nitpicking and I didn't want to do that. I had too much respect right. for them. 
I mean, do you actually know how I got the iPads to work? <laughs> well, go ahead, break down the code for me. The, the... <laughs> I've seen people try and no. do things similar to this. It has come up, yeah, and people have had come up. And even sometimes they've gotten fooled on stuff, where they've gone back to, to the producers in the truck and been like, come on, we can't know how you build a, a, a phone charger or something like that, you know? So uh, there, there have been examples of it. You know, the show is a showcase, and Penn and Teller want it to be a showcase. And, um, you know, back when, you know, in the air between Copperfield up until Fool Us, you know, David Blaine hits and everything else, but it, it becomes very widely um, assumed that camera tricks are always involved uh, in, in making magic stuff after, after, after David Blaine's levitation. Yeah. And so uh, it was basically like Penn and Teller brainstorm of like, how can we get magic on television? And that's where they thought of the idea of fool us. And it wasn't about this idea that like, let's, let's take on all comers. Like we are gladiators of the magic world. But basically, like, by saying, if we're going to sit in these chairs and watch these people on TV and these people are going to perform for us and we're going to try to figure it out, that takes away all of the camera trick elements and everyone at home can just safely assume they're watching some magic being performed live without camera tricks. And so and so for people like you and I, we were like, great, we can get on television and kick ass. We're probably not going to fool those guys. But at the end of the day, that's like one quick question that someone has. And otherwise, we've made an amazing impression on people outside of that. That keeps us, you know, working. I will say this in my experience, that it is always the first question that I get asked. <laughs> <laughs> but I have found a way of making my answer quite concise and get my spiel in. Have I yeah, noticed before, yeah, yeah. anyway? I've got it concise now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the podcast, because that's the first time that sure. you really came to my attention i wasn't joking when i said on my phone yeah. i have like 10 podcasts that i subscribe to and four of them <laughs> are you um so you're on everything yeah it's kind of weird because i feel like we're better friends than we maybe are because you're always in my I... house and you're constantly playing sure yeah but, but you're right but you're right you know what i mean like that's the thing it's like it's unfortunate on my end, that I don't understand how much you're listening to it, but when we do encounter each other, the things you do know, everything you know about me is 100% true. And I get to talk to Pendulette, or I get to talk to Piff the Magic Dragon, um, or my magic podcast with RJ, where I sit down and talk to, um, on you know, my, my subscriber, my little secret subscriber only magic podcast is it's I'm doing a um, I'm always trying to think about I have magicians who listen to the show and I have people who just followed me over from my comedy podcast when before I was a magician that are just continuing to follow my journey as a magician. So, Matt, so what, is the, what is the qualification for getting to listen to your podcast? I know I'm on it. Uh, Two dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, I, I wanted to talk because I didn't come to magic as like growing up as a kid doing magic tricks and trying to keep secrets and stuff. I wanted to talk more openly about magic and not in a way that I wanted to pride myself to give away secrets or being a snob about anything. I just wanted to talk very honestly to a small and special audience about the things I'm struggling with as I grow as a magician. I'll send you another $2 <laughs> if you skip over my episode when you get there. <laughs> Oh, no way, man. I'm going to have you come on. We did that with uh, Brian Brushwood. Brian Brushwood came on, and we actually we tried to bust some of his performance, and we were wrong. So we, we had him come back on and tell us what we got wrong on our oh, podcast. Cool. So we could we can do the same for you. Um, it would be my pleasure, because I'm just sat around at uh, home, yeah. so it would be nice to have something to do. I've enjoyed doing this. I'm not a broadcast journalist like yourself or Richard Young, but I'm enjoying just talking to people that I find interesting, and you're certainly very, very high on that list. Hi, well, so I appreciate I thank it. I you appreciate for coming it. On the show. Wait, wait, wait! Before we do, before we do, I want to talk to you about. I watched a clip of one of these shows where you did torn and restored newspaper on a talk show. Torn and restored I paper did. on a show, and I was like, I was, I can't tell you how much this has been consuming me watching that clip as a, as a student of magic. I'll tell you why. Because everyone thinks, in, you know, everyone hears about doing a trick and making it their own. And Tournament of Short Newspaper is a known trick among magicians. And when you go to do it, I literally was like watching. I was like, is he just, is he doing Tournament of Short Newspaper uh, for television? You know, okay, okay. And the way you start the performance, I was fascinated because it's almost like you didn't want to go through with it. Like you're a little like, okay. And you kind of get it out and you start talking and there's this, there's this like odd nervousness to it. Yeah. And then you perform it in a way that, I've, that I was so good 
and it was so powerful. I've never seen anyone get a reaction like you did off a torn restored newspaper and it was all done by being making it such like this this endeavor to do it and then your script is a little different where you make people betray what they're seeing early and you're and you take the side of the audience instead of you doing a demonstration and i was like oh my gosh i can't believe the tension he is building in this room on this trick and then the payoff you got on it was perfect 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 oh it's funny and i was like it's very difficult to do that moment because <laughs> I know, you have but, to make it so but, but, awkward and you're trying to hold it as long as you can and it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to no, do. No, it's not. It really isn't. And it feels like such a cold scientific demonstration so many times when you watch it. And it was one of the biggest lessons Teller ever taught me about magic, which is he was like, "Do not. you're never doing a demonstration. This isn't a science demo. Life unfolds. Life surprises. You have to make your tricks feel like they unfold and surprise. And every magician talks about making it their own or making their thing their own. And in that trick, you really just make it your own by sheer performance skills. And it's awesome. And oh, I like, couldn't stop thinking about that clip. Oh, well, it's certainly really, really kind of you, Matt. And certainly coming from you, because you really do know what you're talking about. I would not be doing that trick on Fooler's <laughs> if I come back on. <laughs> <laughs> that would be like a, a triple bluff a triple bluff of like he had to have done something different there must be Why something am I we're missing here <laughs> <laughs> Matt it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much thank you Jamie yeah yeah oh Thanks you're for absolutely having me. welcome ladies and gentlemen a huge cyber reaction for the one and only Matt Donnelly good evening this week, we're looking at magician's assistants and how they're being affected by lockdown. Over to me for more. It is a well-known fact that the assistant maketh the magician. They are often the unsung heroes and the reasons that the illusions run smoothly. But will things be the same when lockdown is over? Nearly two months in now of staying safe at home, and statistics have shown that sales of chocolate and other unhealthy snacks have increased drastically and the pounds are being packed on around the world. Magicians are now getting a little worried that the only boxes that their assistants are interested in getting in are boxes of biscuits. This is going to have a massive effect on magic shows when things get back to normal. The zigzag lady is going to have to become the big zag lady. New lycra outfits will have to be made for maximum stretch. The previous incredible moves will now have to be simplified. But worry not, we've got your back with these simple tips. One, the healthy option. Pick only healthy chocolate. It's got real fruit in, it's good for you, and contains many of your five a day. Two, close your eyes. Apparently, if your eyes are closed when eating, you trick your body into thinking you never ate anything in the first place. Three, hygiene helps. Wear your mask at all times. It's a permanent guard against putting anything in your mouth. We hope we've been of help to you this week. Back to me in the studio. Thank you very much again, me, for a fantastic report. Until next week, see you then. Good night. Hey there, how are you? I'm Pete Matthews, and although I'm better known as a juggler, I started my career doing magic. At 16 years old, I went to work to Marvin's Magic in Selfridges in London. In fact, I also worked in Harrods, in Hamleys. I did the Idea of Home Exhibition. And on a later trip back to Hamleys, whilst promoting a yo-yo for Marvin, I got talent scout spotted, I guess, and um, I went on to do You Bet, the TV show You Bet, and that led to my cruise career, as the rest of the say is history. The Dynamic Coins is a great little trick that Marvin used to sell. Two brass caps, 
and a brass ring. No doubt some of your young magicians, in fact, I reckon every magician's got a set of dynamic coins. The ring goes over the cap, you turn it over, you click, you tap, and money appears. If only it was that easy. Marvin taught me many things. One of the most important things they taught me at Marvin's Magic was eye contact when you're de dealing and talking to a crowd. Yes, sir, ma'am, young lady, hi. It's the same for selling stuff. You have to draw them in. Same as if you're doing close-up. You need to be part of the moment. You need to be in the moment with the people. Good advice from Marvin. Um, I was working for Marvin's Magic, a golden era. It was. I, I was there with Mark Paul. I was there with Paul Foster. I was there with Nick Reed. I was there with Anthony Owen. Oh, Anthony Owen. I was there with Lloyd Owen, who went on to do some amazing things. Marvin didn't always employ magicians. He often employed... I'll work on that. Jugglers, entertainers, actors, because he wanted charismatic people. Well, I've gone on to some great things, and my early career with Marvin kick-started it all. So, Marvin, I hope you're watching this. I'm pretty sure you are. Thanks very much for everything you've done for me, and you continue to do for lots of young, aspiring thespians. <gasps> all right, Jamie, once again, great show. Tommy, Adam, super-duper. Great job. I said super-duper. Yes, I did. Cheers, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Our next guest is a massive inspiration to me. I like to consider myself a little bit of an entrepreneur, but I am nothing compared to this gentleman. He brought from, I don't want to say from rags to riches, but from nothing to the biggest magic company in the world in terms of selling magic to real people and inspiring generations uh, into the art form. And the art of magic owes this man a lot. And he has a tremendous story to tell us. And he is a fascinating gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Marvin's Magic, Mr. Marvin Berglass himself is with us. Hi, Marvin. Hey, Jamie. How are you? Oh, thanks for coming on the show. I know that you must be busy, hey? In, even in this lockdown, your business is probably still active. Yeah, we are very active. Uh, thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, it's a mix. It's a funny time, of course, but uh, a lot of people are getting into their hobbies and having more time. So we're doing a lot of online business, and uh, obviously the stores are shut for the moment. But there's a lot of preparation. We've just come off all the back of our trade fairs and stuff. So. Uh, we're ready for the season, yeah, when it reopens. Wow. I'm going to get into, it, obviously, a lot about Marvin's Magic. But before Marvin's Magic, there was just Marvin. <laughs> who, <laughs> um, how, how did you start in Magic? Because you must have been a magician prior. Well, I, obviously, I grew up in a famous magical family that's well documented. And, and Dad was, it is. you know, the... the you know, an inspiration to a generation of, of, of people in, who were into magic. But ironically, I wasn't that interested in magic as a youngster. Um, and Dad, when we went to school to keep our life uh, relatively normal, tended to come off the air in the UK. And he mainly worked abroad on TV series in, in Holland and America and that type of place. So uh, I remember going to a couple of, you know, uh, shows and gigs with him early on. And I remember him doing some amazing stuff like you know, we just waved him goodbye and he was opening for the Rolling Stones once, you know, crazy stuff. You wow. look back and you think, this is incredible. But um, no, I, I, I didn't exactly want to follow in his footsteps. But obviously, you know, I've always been passionate about magic. Uh, and, and it came probably a little later on, on for me from when I was about 16 or 17. But you've managed to do something which is different and you've carved your own place in the uh, Berglas dynasty of magic and you found a different direction and something that I'm sure you've made your father very proud of because hard to get into magic to follow David in. So speaking about my dad, uh, interesting story, just literally found out over the last few weeks. Uh, I was seeing on Twitter someone put, you know, tell us something interesting about you and, and somebody wrote, I gave Austin Powers the tag international man of mystery though i'd nicked it from someone in the stage i can't i got in contact with this guy and it turns out he, it's a guy called rich turner who was uh, at uh, cambridge university and, and a member of the cambridge footlights and uh, he basically went to cambridge with uh, quite a few people like neil malarkey and mike myers and basically it's it transpired when they were working at bbc later that yes he did like that title international man of mystery he had seen it in the stage 
uh, is one of my dad's adverts, and it's only recently put two and two together, but he absolutely acknowledges that the International Man of Mystery, which was dad's strapline at the time, it was, uh, was from that, so that's nice. He's obviously quite unique, and I didn't really just want to be open to comparison, so I actually have always been fairly entrepreneurial, and what he has really helped us with is uh, his motto, which is nothing is impossible, and that really was an inspiration because uh, probably by the time I'd set up school, you know, left school, I'd done a couple of businesses before I set up Marvel's Magic, which I did when I was about 28 years old, uh, and they were already two successful businesses which we kept on as well. So um, it, it, it's you know, I come from a, my mum was an actress, and and um, so I suppose there's show business in the blood, and but I've, as I say, I mixed that with entrepreneur entrepreneurialism you know yes absolutely well you've done a phenomenal job and i think for a, a lot of our viewers I, I think you're a really inspiring story and I, i'd love to go back because now it's so easy to think of marvin's magic as this behemoth of this massive uh, company that we see everywhere when you go I, even now if i go on british airways where they used to have planes i was saying that you could get even a mini marvin's magic set kind of activity box on there yeah it was a snack box that's why we did yeah. that this year yeah yeah so, I, love, I, mean, I love i love taking your magic in places it hasn't normally been you know yeah. you don't expect to see it and it's incredible and it's everywhere but i'd love to rewind to the start because when i was a kid and in fact on this show often we have our friend pete matthews appearing mm. and pete actually began as one of your demonstrators That's right. pete was a great guy i uh, still have fond memories of pete working with us and and uh yeah it's amazing it's a who's who of, of british magic pretty much of the boys who gone on to demonstrate with us but likewise some of our customers have gone on to become professional magicians and tv stars as well so it is a great inspiration and I, i'm always humbled by that so how but, did it start martin you must have started hmm. with a very basic product line and thinking you're going to go in somewhere and try and sell it and i'd love to know how you took it from nothing to there well, so what, what was opportunity the first I, I was I was um, a demonstrator in Hamleys on a, on a product which we still sell today called the Magic Drawing Board, uh, and it was very much a sort of my I had a very instinctive approach to demonstrating right in front of the store and being quite flamboyant and enthusiastic. It was it was doing really well, and the then buyer knew that I had some connection with magic, and Hamleys, of course, used to be very famous for magic back in you know, for a generation before that. So uh, they, they were having a, a, a pretty rough time at the time with cheap Far off, uh, far East knockoffs and that type of stuff. So um, I sort of, light bulb moment came on and said, let me, you know, I earned the opportunity to really have uh, them to give me a, a few months to put something together. And, and, I, and I put together a range of products in really nice gift boxes, well presented, great instructions with fantastic uh, entertaining demonstrators to sell them. And, and that concept really went well. Uh, it was almost a men's gift type of range, really. We put that together in six of the Hamley stores all at once in October 1987, Halloween 1987. And from there, obviously, it's Snowball, then Harrods, Selfridges, F.A. Schwartz in New York. And then uh, just, it just really, you know, went on from there, really. There's a whole story of TV shopping after retail. How, how do we sell without demonstration? Because actually the demonstration is, you know, is not the biggest part of our business, which people perhaps think it is. You know, we sell to a lot of the supermarkets, in fact, and, and stores and online. And, and we sell in 62 countries worldwide currently. Have you ever... Um had or thought about actually opening it in its own store have you always felt that the vehicle is to get it in uh, big traffic areas yeah we have thought about it but as you say the big traffic areas make more sense because you know there's nowhere better than regent street or oxford street or uh, or fifth avenue or new york or rockefeller plaza where we are now where you've got hordes of people then you don't have to lock up at night you've got you know and it's probably you have to put a whole bit of marketing to get people into where you are. And obviously with rates and rents and stuff like that, it's probably better that we work directly with the store. That's the business plan that's worked for us the best anyway. I bet our viewers are particularly interested in the creative of how you get a product and who sits in that room. Obviously you, yourself, you're a big part of driving that forward, but how does that come about, you know? We're going to launch a new product because you create tricks as well. You know, some people may be mistaken watching this thinking that Marvin's uh, rebranded popular stuff, but that was back in the day. I mean, you are creating, creating original magic now, and that's a big process, especially the great, ones you're talking it's, about. It's a great fun process, and you've got to put a different hat on because you've got to look, you know, we love magic, and obviously some gimmicks and things might seem really 
wonderful to us, but for the public, maybe they're not commercial enough. Or so you've got to balance that. But I, I, am, I do head the product development side of things. I work very closely with Justin Monaghan, who was a demonstrator with us all those years back. And what's really nice is that if I look at my managing director, he was also an ex-demonstrator. He was an actor who was in Coronation Street and that sort of thing. And he's gone, come up through the ranks. He's only 34 years old. He's the MD now. I've got a, uh, my sales director came up through the ranks. And a lot of my staff have been with me for 15, 20 years, which is really wonderful. Well, that speaks volumes for how you treat them and how the company is as well and how it will be going forwards. Is there any insight you can give us to anything that might be in development? Like where is Marvin's Magic going in the future? Well, we are doing some very interesting projects. Obviously, the Marvin's Magic app has been really helpful because we try just to take uh, you know, what would be a basic magic product that we have, but we enhance it. If you download the app, you've got... You, you scan the inside of the instruction book when you've got all videos that can be done in different languages. You've got bonus tricks. We use a lot of augmented reality. For example, that you know, you, you obviously, Jamie, being an eye magician, you were very familiar with our eye magic, which won lots of awards. And, and now a lot of that technology is we put to all of our sets so people have that as bonus material. And, yeah. Um, well, I remember I Magic well because we had a conversation about it at the time when uh, you were coming up with the uh, the title. I remember. That's right. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Was, so it was a, a great, it was a great item for us, and it, it, uh, interestingly enough, it is a good example. You know, it did win lots of awards, and we did sell hundreds of thousands over, around the world. But it was one of those things that was so unique that buyers loved it, and it got into the stores. But it sold through okay, not brilliant, not one of our best, because it's actually hard for the people to understand or for the customers to understand immediately all the benefits to it. So sometimes you've got to balance that type of thing out, you know? Yeah, well, maybe I'll take a few of them off your hands. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. um, we, uh, we sell a technology magic set and um, we find that, of course, they've just been to a technology magic show, so they understand it and they have a trust in me because they've just seen me of course. Uh, there. So it works very well, but I don't think it would work at a point of sale. Um, yeah, but, uh, I, but I tell you what's working really well for us. We we, we just um, done our various trade shows before the lockdown. We you know we have showrooms in Hong Kong and we did that, and then we were in uh, London and then uh, Nuremberg at the big trade exhibitions there, then New York and then Australia. And so we've seen all our customers. We've just launched uh, something coming out on se in September, which I'm very excited about, which is Rubik's Cube have got their 40th anniversary, and they approached us. And we put together a really innovative uh, giant jumbo cube, uh, which is a lovely box that you put on your mantelpiece because it looks like a big Rubik's cube anyway. But it's a rigid box full of crammed full of really interesting and fun uh, Rubik themed items. And I had the pleasure of working with Erno Rubik, who was the inventor of uh, the Rubik cube 40 years ago. And me and my team, we, we, we showed him a lot of stuff and which he enjoyed. And that's that's hopefully something that people. We'll see shortly from well, September. Rubik's, you know, you're good at following trends, and Rubik's Cube magic is now a, a big thing, and I'm sure a lot of the kids are seeing it on TV, and I can see that probably a few magicians watch this show will even be interested to get their hands on that. Yeah, so that sounds, like, um, that sounds like it'd be a great project. Marvin, this is absolutely fascinating. You know I could talk to you all night about this mm -hmm. stuff because I'm passionate about uh, business and entrepreneurs, and every time I talk to you, you're always so upbeat, and you're always looking for answers that are yes, and not looking for, <laughs> you know, any kind of negative. And I love those kind of people in my life. So I, I really too. appreciate you taking Thanks, some time too. to come on the show, Marvin, You know, yeah, I really do. Um, Marvin, have you anything else that you want to tell us today? Well, I just think this obviously is a very unique situation and there's obviously a huge amount of negativity for a lot of people and uh, it's very sad. But on the other hand, I think it's, you know, if we put on the, your other hat, it's a time where we're with family, friends and uh, we, we can do things that perhaps we wouldn't have time to do normally. And, uh, you know, seeing a lot of creativity in the magic world coming through this type of medium and, and, uh, and I think it gives us a, a chance to take stock and hopefully develop things and maybe we have to look a bit differently about how we do things for the future because I'm sure uh, for example close-up magic would it be called close-up magic I don't know <laughs> maybe it's no. called something distant, <laughs> social distance yeah. magic I don't know but it makes us think differently it challenges us and uh, I think you know things evolve and, and hopefully some good will come out of this serious situation well hey you know we're one of the oldest time oldest professions in the world i'm sure that magic will find a way to endure as will marvin's magic go from strength to strength thank you <laughs>
It's an absolute pleasure, Marvin. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Everybody, let's have Tommy a huge cyber reaction from Mr. Marvin Berglas, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And of course, thank you to Marvin Berglas. That was fascinating, hey? And uh, what a great show we've had. Uh, lots and lots of guests. We've got a big show coming up your way next week. One star guest. We're going to tell you about that in a moment. But uh, before then, we're just going to check in with the fellas and we'll get a bit of a lowdown. How do you think the show went, Tommy? I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. It was great seeing James Moore, um, who actually comes from uh, my local area as well. So it was great seeing him on there, as well as everyone else, of course, as well. It was a great show and enjoyed it. Yeah, it was good. Very chatty this week. I'm having a great time with it. And uh, Adam, Adam, did you enjoy the show? Any tips, any tricks? Yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed that. To see Marvin speak as well. I mean, uh, that man's got a lot to answer for. I spent all my pocket money on his tricks growing up. And uh, that, that was brilliant. He's a lovely guy as well, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he certainly does. And Adam, your spot was great on the show a couple of nights ago on our new show, uh, Magicians Doing Tricks. Oh, thanks, mate. It was great fun. Yeah. Great fun. Good response. Yeah, it was great. So you should go back and look at that, everybody. We've got a new live stream show out now, which is called Magicians Doing Tricks. Um, and that show is on our same Facebook page. You'll find it below. And it's also on YouTube. So as always, I'm going to ask you uh, to follow us, uh, to follow us all, you know, to follow Nat and, uh, of course, myself and Adam and Tommy and all of our guests. You know, you'll find us on all social media. We really appreciate it. And uh, I always say this, we do this show for the love. Um, but we we love to hear that you are enjoying it and the best way you can show us with that is with a comment a like and to share it with your friends and to like our pages that really really helps us and inspires us to keep going and doing more of these things but for now we're going to say goodbye to everybody so Tommy goodbye goodbye everyone have a great week and we'll see you next week yeah absolutely and Adam see you soon okay see you next week guys absolutely and Matt Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Stay tuned for our big guest announcement. My name's Jamie Allen. We'll see you next Friday. fan of magic then be sure to check out our public live stream show that runs on Fridays at 7 p.m. on my public Facebook page that is Jamie Allen I Magician and the show of course is I Magician Live it features some great laughs and also some fantastic celebrity interviews from the biggest names in magic like Hans Klopp, Christian Fahler, Russ Stevens, Chris Cox, Jonathan Goodwin, Mark Spellman, and many, many more. Also, for more unseen content, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for many behind-the-scenes clips and full interviews with some of the biggest names in magic.